Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Wednesday, March 13th. It's a gorgeous day here in Annapolis. Today's episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, my guest today is Major Ryan Ratcliffe, United States Marine Corps. He's one of the co-authors of the winning essay from last year's CNO Naval History Essay Contest. Uh, the essay appears in the February issue of Proceedings. It's titled, When Deterrence Fails, Warfighting Becomes Supreme. And if you got the print issue of Proceedings, again, it's the one with the uh, guys stacking BBs on, a, on an F-18 on a uh, the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Uh, you can find the article on pages 66 and 67. Uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Bill. Really appreciate you having me. Yeah, I also want to mention your co-author, Professor Doug Bryant. Couldn't join us today, uh, but he was 50-50 uh, with you on the winning team and the uh, and the winnings of this uh, prize-winning essay. I think you guys split a, uh, a grand prize of $5,000, so uh, congrats on that. Nice uh, nice little spending money. Um, tell us, uh, tell our listeners about your background, what you do in the Marine Corps. So my background, uh, I started out in the EA-6B Prowler as an electronic warfare officer. Uh, I sunned down the Prowler in 2019, had the pleasure of flying in the sundown ceremony, uh, proceeded to do a joint terminal attack controller tour or forward air controller tour after that with 1st Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Squadron. Got a deployment into the uh, Indo-Pacific out of that and then came back in, as part of the civilian school program, went to Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't think the uh, amazing cohort of professors that I had there at that institution, um, but in particular, uh, Dr. Mankin, Dr. Brands, and uh, Ambassador Edelman all, all helped uh, kind of talk through some of the issues on this uh, paper that Dr. Bryant and I wrote. Uh, from school, I went to the Vandegrift team uh, and Deputy Commandant for Information, uh, and I met Dr. Bryant on that team, and we worked together to uh, kind of work across Headquarters Marine Corps as well as the Department of the Navy uh, to tackle some of the challenges from a Deputy Commandant of Information perspective. And what we started to see uh, kind of brought some concern and the original title, kind of working title of this essay was uh, Fighting Fatalism or Resisting Resignation. We were back and forth on that. Uh, and then as we took kind of a more historical bend, it became learning from history in the making. Uh, as we saw, there are a lot of relevant lessons from history that we try to extract and bring forward to today and recognize that what's going on in the world around us uh, in many ways, as has been said before, rhymes what has happened in the past. And we wanted to evaluate some of those rhymes and see what we could uh, extract to learn from today. Uh, and since then, uh, I now work uh, in the office of the Chief of Naval Operations. And it's been an amazing opportunity to see kind of the Navy and Marine Corps integration efforts going forward. But I would like to foot stomp that uh, anything that I say here is my own personal view, does not reflect the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, the United States Marine Corps, or uh, the United States Navy. Uh, but I really am looking forward to this conversation. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, you're the, the Marine flag aide to Admiral Frank Hedy, correct? I am, yes, sir. Yeah, congrats. That's a that's a, a big job. I'll also, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned Johns Hopkins uh, uh, SICE, uh, School of Advanced International Studies. In, in my career in the Navy, some of the clearest thinking people, either in uniform or civilians, who I worked with in a variety of different joint assignments, were SICE grads. I was a huge fan, and whenever I had the opportunity, if I was on a hiring panel and we we had the opportunity to hire a SICE grad, it was like, oh yeah, we're we're doing that because uh, it just it it helped clarify the thinking of the staff or the headquarters element or the J2 element. I worked with some terrific people who are SICE grads, so congrats on being a grad of that program. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Doug Bryant and, and his background too. Yeah, so Dr. Bryant was a Army intelligence officer, uh, and then he got his PhD in cognitive psychology uh, with an emphasis on neurobiology, and he came and as a contractor working from MITRE to bring some expertise in uh, in the 
cognitive psychology realm for the deputy commandant of, uh, for information. And we, we really hit it off right away. Uh, we're friends to this day. We're still co, uh, co-writing pieces together. And um, he brought a really interesting perspective in just how we kind of think about these problems. And we were able to tag team these efforts. And uh, as I mentioned, kind of try and demonstrate that there are lessons from history that prevent us from having to uh, essentially resign ourselves or consign ourselves to whatever comes our way. We think that things can be done now to help uh, prepare for what we might see in the future. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. I, I, I'll um, highlight just a uh, public service announcement. The uh, This year's uh, CNO Naval History Essay Contest deadline is coming up at the end of April. Uh, there are three categories of that contest. So the Naval Institute, we essentially administer the contest for the Navy uh, in partnership with Naval History and Heritage Command. We have since 20. 17, the, the first year that the contest started. Uh, the categories are a rising historian category, and that was you and, and Doug. Neither of you are professional historians, um, and you still active duty, uh, you know, in the in the envelope, part of the envelope of your career. There is a midshipman and cadet category. So if you're a student cadet midshipman at the Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, Merchant Marine Academy, NROTC, um, then you can write for that uh, that category of the contest, and then there's a professional historian category. So that's the people that are, you know, PhD historians, the B.J. Armstrongs of the world, uh, you know, the Trent Hone and Tom Hone kind of folks who are who have written and published books uh, on naval history. So there's three categories this contest. Uh, some nice prize money, five thousand for first prize, twenty five hundred, and then fifteen hundred for third. And um, the deadline for this year is uh, is coming up fast. So that's just a PSA for the contest itself. Let's let's get into your article. Uh, one one more thing, I, I will um, I'll, I'll footstomp. I often get the question when people see a, a history article in proceedings, and then they they know we have Naval History Magazine as well. And so I'll get, I'll get, hey Bill, how come this history article appeared in proceedings? And we we delineate the two. If it's sort of purely history it tends to go in Naval History Magazine. Um, and then if it's applied history, in other words, what do we learn from the less, you know, lessons of history, which your article definitely fits in that category, we tend to put it in proceedings rather than in Naval History. So applied history, more proceedings, pure history, uh, and both are suitable content for this contest in any one of those categories. So some of the winners are in Naval History, some of the winners are in proceedings, uh, and, and anyway, okay. So enough about that. Let's go on to the article. Um, it starts off. You, 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 uh, you and Doug start off by saying there are three ideas today that seem to enjoy widespread support. First is the character of war is changing. The second is that competition with China represents a generational change, and the third is that deterring wars is at least as important as winning them. And you point to deterrence being at the core of many US strategic documents. But you go on to use the current war in Ukraine as an example of what happens when deterrence fails. So take it from there. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think uh, you know the, the generational challenge that China presents is at the forefront of a lot of these strategic documents, as is uh, the changing character war and the need to deter. But what we saw in the lead up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 is that much of the infrastructure that was put in place to deter uh, clearly was not going to break the threshold for what Vladimir Putin was willing to do and willing to risk in those circumstances. So while deterrence is key and crucial, uh, what we see is that sometimes circumstances progress in a way that precludes deterrence. And when that happens, we have to be prepared to fight and win decisively in that environment. Uh, additionally, you know, there's there's generally two main camps for uh, deterrence, deterrence by punishment, deterrence by denial. Uh, when you're trying to take a deterrence by denial approach, fielding the capabilities that can help you when decisively, if messaged appropriately, can also contribute to that deterrent effect. But then if deterrence fails, you have fielded the capability that is going to allow you to fight back in that environment and to uh, ideally win decisively in conflict. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of the cover type of the issue, uh, 
that your article appears in. You know, that's kind of it in a in a bumper sticker. If you want peace, if you want to deter, you got to prepare for war. Otherwise, you know, your deter deterrence might fail. Um, so, in in true fashion of a of a good applied history article, uh, your your yours uh, provides a couple of uh, really poignant historical parallels and lessons. So start with Ukraine as Poland. Yeah. And uh, one thing I would like to point out is that we we did write the article about a year ago. Um, so a lot has changed in Ukraine. A lot has changed in the world. Uh, yep. What we see in the Red Sea, what's happened uh, in the Black Sea, and then, and then of course, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but I think one of the you know, we cheated a little, uh, it's a naval history contest, but we, we wrote about, uh, with, with Poland, we wrote about Blitzkrieg and kind of the, the first elements of Blitzkrieg that were, uh, a, I guess, on display when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, uh, roughly nine months prior to the full on invasion of France that we often associate with Blitzkrieg. And there were many, uh, who looked at what was happening in Poland and saw some of the new tactics and techniques and procedures and the kind of operational concepts that were on display. Um, and yet those lessons, those observations were not learned. They were not incorporated into uh, France's position. And one of the things it is very frequently studied, but the Maginot Line uh, one of the greatest military construction projects ever undertaken uh, was it was evident if you looked at Poland that it would not be as effective as it needed to be. It still had some effects in the conflict, certainly, um, but the lessons were not learned. And in many ways, because of the scale and the investments in the Maginot Line, it was almost kind of a sunk cost fallacy of, well, we've mm -hmm. built it, we need to use it and trying to apply what presently existed to current circumstances instead of looking at current circumstances, looking at what was in front of them, and then applying the lessons provided by those observations and then op creating new operating concepts or new models. It's extremely hard to do. Obviously, um, any type of military construction is, is both time intensive and uh, co very costly. But we have on display in front of us in Ukraine what some of these changing character of war aspects are going to be. We see these loitering top-down mun um, strike munitions. We see these small uh, unmanned aerial systems that are manned portable and can be controlled at the squad, the fire team, or even the individual level. And we see the effects that those are having on the battlefield. And it's incumbent upon us as America's defenders and as those going out to achieve that deterrent effect and be prepared to respond in crisis and win decisively in war, it's incumbent upon us to learn those lessons and incorporate those lessons and develop the capabilities that are going to hopefully reduce the amount of strategic surprise and the amount of effort that has to go into modernizing our force if a conflict does arise. Uh, do you see um, do you see examples of learning those lessons in the force right now? I think the force is working to learn those lessons. Uh, you know, the Navy has the disruptive capabilities office and come, that goes alongside the defense innovation unit. Uh, the Marine Corps has its own Marine innovation unit. Uh, Army Futures Command is looking at a lot of different projects. And then, of course, the replicator initiative is garnering much attention. Um, there is a, you know, a very interesting article in the most recent proceedings about repl replicating munitions as opposed to to small UAVs uh, or UASs or, or unmanned systems in general. And I think that that's a really interesting discussion to have uh, because what we see right now is asymmetry is growing. And, and we kind of touch on that later in this piece, but with asymmetry, the cost differential or the potential for cost differential is is growing greater as capabilities become more and more expensive. And so if we can replicate or produce these relatively cheap munitions that either elicit an expensive response or that cause a nonlinear or disproportionate uh, amount of damage relative to the cost of the munition, then that is of significant benefit to whoever is deploying that cheaper munition. And so I know that argument was was kind of generally made in that article. And I think that the efforts underway to look at what type of unmanned systems can be replicated or built quickly uh, at large numbers 
and then applying that similar model to these standoff munitions to the essentially the democratized precision strike regime uh, is something that is being done. But I would argue, and I think that there are many who would argue that it's not being done fast enough. Uh, and I think that we need to learn those lessons quickly because I think uh, I remember hearing recently that uh, a high level Ukrainian official it may have been um, President Zelensky himself was advocating for buying a million small UAVs. And I think that we see those investments driving industry around the world right now. And we need to be looking at what we can do to drive our industry domestically, as well as capitalize on the lessons being learned around the world as they develop those capabilities. So kind of a circuitous answer to say, I, I think there are some initiatives out there. I think they need to be accelerated even faster and we need to see what we can be learning from similar or analogous initiatives around the world. Yeah, your your comments remind me of uh, two things. One, you refer to Sam Tangretti's article, which is our general prize essay contest winning essay this year. It's in the March issue of Proceedings. Um, I think it is titled uh, "Replicate Weapons, Not or Munitions, Not Drones, or Not Not Cheap Drones." Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, you you point to uh, the lessons. It's not just in Ukraine, but also what the Houthis are doing in the Red Sea, where we're seeing them launch five ten thousand dollar cheap, you know, relatively cheap drones and and missiles at uh, the the Prosperity Guardian forces in the Red Sea. That are responding with SM2s, threes, um, or you know some other fairly expensive weapons. Uh, in 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 one case, the Gravely uh, was SeaWiz, so that's not an expensive option, but it is a high pucker factor option when you get within Sea SeaWiz range of a ship. So, yeah, the, that 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 cost trade is an important one to consider. And I know the Navy, you know, seniors. We had the SWO boss, Admiral. Um, uh, McLean was on the show about a month ago, and he he brought this issue up. He specifically was talking about, you know, directed energy weapons, lasers, um, high power microwave. What are some other options that will get us on the right side of the cost curve in that kind of uh, trade space? Um, the other uh, historical parallel or analogy that you give is uh, Guam as Pearl Harbor. So talk about that for a minute. Yeah, um, certainly. I'd like to touch real quick, just circle back. Uh, I think one interesting point that I've heard come out uh, in several discussions, though, is it's also really hard when you're looking at the when you're talking about the cost benefit analysis of using these like, more expensive weapon systems to shoot down these these cheap uh, UAVs. You also have to take into account the cost of inaction. If you did not expend that expensive munition uh, early in the days where the Houthis started firing uh, munitions into the Red Sea, there was talk of uh, insurance companies refusing to allow ships insured by them to go through those narrow passageways. And but now that, as you mentioned, uh, we have forces there defending the free and open international uh, trade that has provided prosperity to billions around the world that trade continues to flow. And so while the munitions are certainly expensive, the benefit of those munitions uh, is in many ways asymmetric itself. But the, the kind of counterpoint is, can we be doing it in a more economical way? And that's where I think, you know, I, I know there are a lot of conversations happening about that. Uh, and there are a lot of initiatives underway to answer that question to try and get to that point where uh, the, the munition versus threat symmetry is greater which only makes the asymmetry of protecting free and open oceans even greater. Those but, are all good points. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, you're you're preaching in the choir. Absolutely. Uh, now, uh, Guam, Guam as Pearl Harbor. So uh, there, there are, they are certainly not perfect analogs. Um, but if you look at the circumstances surrounding Pearl Harbor prior to World War II and many of the circumstances surrounding Guam today, there are a lot of similarities. And there is a great deal of talk uh, in numerous publications about the threats that exist to Guam. Uh, we've seen threats to its critical infrastructure come out uh, from non-kinetic actors, and that's been uh, discussed as, as widely as in the New York Times. Uh, there are missiles that are nicknamed the Guam Killer. And 
in our mind, what Guam needs to look at is what happened to Pearl Harbor, but it's not just Pearl Harbor. To me, it's the Cactus Air Force on Guadalcanal and what happened there where they continue to take hits day in and day out, at day and night, but they continue to launch sorties day in and day out and to fight the fight while under duress. And so in my mind, uh, one of the things that has to be considered with Guam is, are we putting the right forces there to defend our American territory? Because it is a territory, it is part of the homeland. Are we putting the right forces there to defend the territory, to defend the homeland? Are we also putting the right capabilities and capacity to repair and sustain operations in the face of repeated kinetic and non-kinetic threats? And are we also putting the right capabilities and capacities to sustain operations throughout in a fight? So, you know, there's there's the de defensive aspect of it. There's the repair aspect of it. And then there's the combat sustainment and logistics aspect of it. And the warning signs were there for Pearl Harbor. And by learning some of those lessons and heeding some of those signs that exist for Guam today, uh, we think that some of that could be headed off and it creates, again, that deterrent effect. But if deterrence fails, then you have the capability to sustain those operations beyond the uh, commencement of hostilities. Yeah, great points. Um, your, your article after uh, talking about uh, Poland and, and Guam, uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, you, you go into some lessons of the interwar years and how U.S. naval carrier aviation innovated and drove some changes to the character of war. So just a reminder, back at the top of the show, you know, one of the three things that you guys start off with your, your article is, is uh, you know, that, that the character of war is changing rapidly. So what are some, you, you, your article lists the four elements that drove those changes in the U.S. Navy, and what are some of the innovation lessons for today's Navy and Marine Corps? So uh, this is extracted from Williamson and Murray's Military Innovation in the Interwar Period, uh, a really great uh, academic piece on how militaries innovate or sometimes fail to innovate. But the four processes that they outlined uh, were generally key individuals attaining positions from which to promote and influence development. Aviation became its own separately funded organization. Uh, one thing I've learned getting into the headquarters on both the Navy and Marine Corps side, it truly is all about the budget. Uh, wherever the money goes, that's where the effort is going to go. And we need to make sure that uh, the money is going where it needs to and that we're going where the money is going as well. Uh, and then aviation developments responded to external changes uh, and then an ad hoc innovation process linked visions of the future to technical experimentation. And we really kind of honed in on this one lesson in particular uh, as that feedback loop is kind of what we saw as the critical link that allowed the U.S. Naval Air Forces to develop the capabilities and the capacity to operate in the ways that they needed to during the Second World War. Uh, if those processes had not uh, taken place and if that learning had not taken place and the innovation had not really taken hold, uh, truly, I think the outcome of the war in the Pacific would be up for debate uh, as the, many of those innovations led to some of the earliest successes, including at Midway. Uh, which in many ways turned the tide of, uh, of the war in the Pacific. And so the, the feedback loop that, uh, in short, was essentially visions of the future being crafted out of the war college and war games. And then you had some of these new aviation personnel looking at those visions of the future, drawing some kind of experimental ideas, and then putting those to the test both out in the fleets as well as in fleet battle problems and in war games. And then that fed back into visions of the future. And that's where the feedback loop came in and it continued to refine. And I think, again, we're seeing some of that today. Um, but what I think needs to be done is that feedback loop needs to get smaller and accelerate. Um, part of the challenge is the scale and pace of change in technology. There's so many new technological developments on so many different fronts in order to experiment effectively. You're, by the time you have your lessons from your experimentation, they're almost outdated. Mm. And so trying to figure out how to get that experimenting uh, experimentation completed 
as quickly as possible and then to get that fed back into those visions of the future to get that fed back into those bigger picture war games those fleet battle problems those exercises that are uh, going to inform future experimentation efforts getting that timeline uh, as quick as possible i think is going to be one of the greatest challenges um, but it's also because as i used the term democratization earlier of the precision strike regime that experimentation can happen at some of the lowest levels and so finding a way to to capture those lessons learned from the, you know, the I'm not speaking to a specific uh, echelon, but a Marine rifle squad who goes out and comes up with some amazing new tactic, technique or procedure, ensuring that that TTP gets captured and then disseminated to the broader Marine Corps. That's the type of feedback loop that we need to to strive to uh, instill in the force. And it's hard, but there's also a lot of opportunity because it is so uh, disparate, for lack of a better term. Yeah, uh, not to uh, pat proceedings on the back too hard um, <laughs> in self-congratulatory mode, but uh, I, I'll add um, two two thoughts to that. One is that um, you know you mentioned uh, War College and uh, the stand up of it of its own um, uh, community, uh, and then the fleet battle problems. Um, but also, you know, and uh, Trent Hone mentions this in his book, Learning War, mm -hmm. Proceedings actually was part of that feedback loop as well. And I, I would argue, and I hope it still is, but others are too, War on the Rocks and Simsec. Uh, people like you, J you know, young JOs or, or, you know, senior enlisted people in the force, that feedback loop, speeding up that feedback loop um, includes professional writing. It includes the, you know, the observations that you have at your level and the ideas for, hey, we're doing this, but we could do that instead, or we could do it differently, or we could buy different things, you know, that this is part of that feedback loop and, and helping to accelerate it uh, to, to stay ahead of the, the changing character of war. Um, the um, kind of winding things down here, we've got a few minutes left, but um, you you end the article on a, on a sort of, you know, what are the lessons or how do today's Marine Corps and Navy leaders learn from some of these parallels or analogies or historical lessons. So let's talk about that a little bit. What are what are some key takeaways that you know perhaps you would you would push up to senior folks uh, in the sea services today? I think one of the challenges um, that our senior leaders face today is the range of potential problem sets that they are going that they need to be prepared to confront. Um, you cannot focus myopically on any one scenario. Um, and so that makes creating that feedback loop hard. It makes learning lessons hard. Uh, for example, uh, the Ukrainian Navy has uh, essentially no Navy, uh, and yet they've succeeded in shutting down significant portions of the Black Sea. Uh, does that mean that we don't need a Navy? A absolutely not. Uh, but finding the right lessons and learning the, the right lessons in the right ways, I think is gonna be a significant challenge for uh, our senior leaders. And there are many great conversations having uh, being had about precisely that. And I think learning how, while, you know, there, are, there is talk about wars, nature potentially changing. Uh, I don't know that we're quite there yet. Um, so while there is changing character, there's also an immutable nature to war. And, and I think that that kind of concept persists in many ways in, in the hum anything that involves human beings. There are certain things that change and there are certain things that remain the same. Making sure, uh, for lack of a better phrase, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and get rid of some of and that we hold on to the things that are immutable. Trust in our subordinates, empowering our subordinates learning good leadership principles and becoming better leaders, becoming better humans. I think all of those things make the United States of America uh, in many ways uniquely suited to confront the range of challenges because we teach people to think instead of teaching them how to fight. Uh, we, we do teach them how to fight, but, but that's not all we teach them. And teaching people how to think and to respond on their own, empowering them to do that, building the trust with them that they know that you're going to have their back that is an immutable principle of war, in my opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. And so ensuring that we kind of separate 
the technology from the people, but also recognize how the technology affects the people and how the people affect the technology and creates a broader ecosystem of, of combat, I think is something that we really need to study. Um, and learning from previous periods of change, like the interwar period, are offer a great um, insights into how some of those challenges can be addressed without taking them too far. And maybe there are some times where we have taken it too far and we need to learn those lessons just as much. Uh, lessons of failure can be just as good and sometimes probably better instructors than, uh, than lessons of success. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the uh, Ukrainian Navy, the fact that it really doesn't have a Navy. Uh, and uh, so their front page New York Times uh, story today was about uh, Vladimir Putin relieving the chief of the uh, of the Russian Navy. Uh, and I think the, uh, the the chief of the Black Sea Fleet has also been relieved, um, largely because they started out with about 80 ships. And they're down down 15 or more. Um, and, and, you know, they, they've lost that to a, a Navy that doesn't even have a Navy. Uh, so yeah, really, really some good points there about bringing it back to Ukraine, bringing it back to, um, a, a bit of the trust and pushing, um, you know, commander's intent down as far as you can, um, about educating people, not just training them for, uh, for the fight, but also educating them to, uh, to be able to think on their feet. Uh, and adapt. Uh, all good points. Um, uh, final round here, saved rounds, or is there? are there any questions I should have asked that I didn't ask? <laughs> um, I, I think I would just like to foot stomp again the urgency. Um, the, the lessons are on display. We need to be taking every opportunity that we have to capture those lessons and then to learn from those lessons our, ourselves and to create concepts that apply to or or even doctrine uh to take it a, a step further doctrine that applies to the circumstances in which we find ourselves instead of trying to make what we have fit into the current circumstances and then create the doctrine uh, sometimes it's going to make hard decisions uh obviously i know uh you recently hosted uh, commander van den engel and his his talk on questioning the carrier i think that's a great conversation to be uh having i think the carrier is proving uh, some value in the Red Sea right now. And I think there are a number of circumstances where the carrier does offer significant value to the joint force, but that doesn't mean that it's the most valuable or the best value proposition in all circumstances. Uh, and so the quicker we can learn those things and invest in the capabilities that allow us to respond uh, when we need to respond in the ways that we need to respond, I think those that urgency is something that cannot be overstated. Um, and other than that, I, I really appreciate what Proceedings does. Uh, it's been uh, an amazing opportunity to write into Proceedings and then to, to get to connect with some of the other authors and to have these conversations, uh, both uh, professionally in the magazine and then also uh, individually. And so I, I appreciate what you guys do. Well, we can't publish anything without uh, the, the, the submissions from authors like you and Doug. Uh, just great content. And uh, we're happy to provide the open forum for to publish it and then to have the the debate that ensues afterwards so thank you for what you've done and what you continue to do in your job uh, on active duty and then in the marine corps um so my guest today has been uh, marine corps major ryan ratcliffe the article that he and his co-author doug bryant wrote it's in the february proceedings it's titled when deterrence fails war fighting becomes supreme Ryan, thanks for writing for Proceedings, for being on the show, and congrats again for winning the CNO Naval History Essay Contest, which is a very big deal. Thanks, Bill. All right. Awesome to have you. Um, and as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, the CNO Naval History Essay Contest for 2024 is underway now, and the deadline is 30 April. You can find out information about that contest and all of our contests at usni.org forward slash essay dash contest. Again, usni.org forward slash essay dash contest. Today's show is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. You can learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. And until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.